Welcome. Welcome to our last panel of our conference, Climate Justice and Feminism. And uh, this panel has the name Feminist Solution for Climate Justice. And I love to welcome three different women from different regions or from around the world who are with us um, today, this evening. And uh, first, I would love to welcome uh, Dorothy Nalubega from Uganda. You can wave so people know who you are. Um, and well, you are a climate justice activist from Uganda and also an activist for women and other vulnerable groups' rights. And also, you are the chairperson of Kuna Women Sustainable Agriculturalist and Environmental Group, where we will hear more from later. And then I would love to welcome Ned Dano, um, the co-executive director of the ETC Group. And the ETC Group monitors the impact of emerging technologies and cooperation strategies on biodiversity, <laughs> sorry, biodiversity agriculture and human rights. And you are a researcher who has extensive experience in development and policy work on issues in agriculture, uh, biosafety, climate change, and environmental governance in Southeast Asia. Welcome. And also I would love to welcome Helena Marshall, um, an activist from Fridays for Future and also an activist for climate justice. And she's a student for economic and politics. So welcome to our panel, and I would love directly to start in our first round. And um, I would love to do the same thing I did last evening, um, not like to ask a dry question, but either ask for stories. Um, because for me, it took me a while to understand that, well, because I'm a woman, my voice didn't count the same way and that I had to work sometimes five times harder to get recognition. And as soon as I start to show a little bit of emotions, um, well, I count as weak and not fit for the job to fight for climate justice. Um, well, also inside our climate justice movement. And uh, for me, it helped to hear other stories um, or yeah, other perspectives of women who have the same experience. Um, to understand that it's, well, it is just because I'm a woman that I get treated in that way. <laughs> and um, so I would love just to break the ice and to share some stories, um, bad or good, funny or crazy. Um, so what do you, um, what is your special story? What do you connect now with the topic of climate justice and feminism? So who would love to start? I mean, I can start. Um, I yeah. feel like I don't have a very spectacular story um, because it's so much more in like the little moments that we see again and again, how even in like a space like the climate justice movement, which is fighting for like a more just world and we still have to obviously deal with the patriarchy and we still have to deal with inequalities in our society because they don't go away like in the climate movement or in climate spaces and you know a lot of the time that's just seeing your idea you that you just said get said again by a cis male in the room who and then it's suddenly the best idea in the world and then you think wait I just said that <laughs> or that you see again and again how um we you know how we have to how how women often don't even raise their hands and they don't even take part in the discussion because you know they think okay maybe idea, my idea is not as good as I thought and so on and I feel like um, that is obviously something that's not specific to the climate movement but something specific to our society as a whole and that can be really exhausting to you know we are already fighting against these huge inequalities we're fighting against you know fossil companies we are fighting against so much and then to also have to fight against that is obviously not not really that great uh, but at the same time I've also in the climate movement um, had this like amazing group of women I've met like so many amazing women who support each other who have safe spaces who come together and that is so empowering to see that even though often women get 
on social media like a lot more comments and really sexualized comments that we like come together and persevere and that really inspires me to see like all the other amazing women in this movement doing like really cool things. Thank you so much. Um, I can recognize so much in your answer. Um, Nat or Dorothy, do you would love to add something? Yeah. I'll I'll go next. Like I I really empathize a lot with what um Elena um told us. Like I've I've experienced that so many times um in the in the movement. This is both the environmental and climate justice movement. It it could be very, very subtle. Especially in discussions among peers where you have um uh, men who are supposed to be progressive and aware and awakened, but as Elena mentioned, like the 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 deep seated uh, patriarchy, um, in many cases is hard to sh to to shed. But um, concretely, like I work in the technology fund, in the technology sphere, you no, know, like um, environmental technologies and also climate climate technologies, and it's a very very macho world. Like um, in many in many discussions um, that involve other actors beyond civil society, I would sometimes end up as the only woman um, in the group discussing issues on climate technologies, both adaptation and and mitigation. And you could actually sense, you know, the condescension <laughs> in many cases um, among um, men um, on the table whenever I speak. And there's also an additional layer of discrimination there, you no? Know? Like um, it's less being in the south, but actually more being coming from civil society. You know, like in the technology front, um, there is this um, assumption that someone has to have um, the credentials, you know, like the academic credentials of being able to talk about and critique um, technological um, solutions. Like they would even ask, like. What is your background? Oh, when, you, when they say, what is your background? What is your academic background? And also they would say, oh, um, NGOs are, are supposed to talk and also deal with communities, like basically putting you in a corner that you are not on par, on par with them. And these are mostly men. And in, in a few instances, I've actually been called out about being emotional. I've never heard that being said to a man in any discussion, but always to a woman. And in, as I said, in a few circumstances, I've been called, you're being too emotional. Or they would even say uh, very subtly that we cannot rely on emotions when we talk about climate and environment. It has to be science-based or evidence-based. Like actually um, saying, saying in many ways that you are talking based on your feelings um, and less on concrete evidences and science, as if those are two um, um, mutually um, exclusive. And as I said, always being said um, to, to a woman or to women um, in the conversations, but never to a man. So they, these are very subtle. Um, sometimes you, you really have just to call it out and you would become very, very defensive about it. Um, and uh, as Helena said, like it, it's really a struggle, you know, for activists in in the climate and also um, environmental movements um, to address this. Like I, I hate saying to prove yourself because I really don't want to prove myself to anybody, um, especially among um, among peers um, in the movement. But that's what it turns out. Like you have to prove yourself, you know. Like show that you have credentials and also that it's just it's beyond uh, feelings that you're talking about evidence and, and science. So it's really um, a struggle, a multi-layer struggle for women um, to be dealing on these issues and also assert um, that we are equals and um, um, really also um, highlighting the issues on, on feminism um, in both the environmental and climate movement. Thank you so much. Um, Dorothy, do you want to add something? Let me tell you one story that I encountered during my first years of leadership. I belong to the East African Greens Federation as an executive member in charge of women, children, and vulnerable groups. Whenever we got funding for an activity, 
I always asked that some portion be allocated for women's activities because we really wanted to do an activity on, on gender and uh, energy. But they always said it will be a side event on a big activity and, and only on the last day. So one time I said to myself, why don't I write a proposal specifically for East African women? Because we don't get time to do our own stuff. I did write one, it was gender and clean energy because we are the ones who suffer with cooking. Uh, I wanted to do something like that, but you know what happened? When uh, Green Forum of Sweden agreed to fund our activity and they talked to the East African Greens executive, which was then dominated by men, when the men learned of it, that we are going to have our own activity independent of, of them. The coordinator for, 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 for the Swedish Greens of Green Forum did not even feel ashamed to tell me that Dorothy, you know what? The men feel so bad that you are going to have a workshop without involving them. So what we are going to do is to reduce on the number of days for your activity so the men can join you for another program. So I even wondered that even this gentleman from a civilized part of the world can give in to the cries of the men. Imagine they refused to give us time during the past activities. And when we decided to have full time, they came in and even dictated on which women I should put on my invitation list. But I'm telling you, that's the last time I danced to their tunes because they dominated our discussion and we didn't even achieve our goals. We didn't, our women didn't have time to talk for themselves because these people, the men dominated our, our workshop. From then on, I got the power and I, encourage, I, I was encouraged to fight for our rights, the rights to be had. So I mean that thing hurt me so much. And that's why now I try to fight for the rights of women and, the, and climate justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story, um, which is pretty, pretty bad. Um, and I would love like to, to continue um, for our next round and go in, well, in, in an event that's also like um, go a little bit in the same direction because Ned, I would love to ask you um, because um, I remember when I first met you uh, some years ago at the UN Climate Conference, you told me also a lot about fall solutions. Um, and I love to ask you again, if you can explain to us, um, what did you mean with fall solution tackling the climate crisis? And um, also, do they have something to do with fewer women in decision-making structures? Yeah, thanks, Katrin, for remembering that. Yes, I remember telling you that um, in one of the UNFCCC um, COPs, and we're far, we're probably um, a few years after after that, and never have I seen um, a year when there was when there's so much false solutions that are being peddled as the solution to the climate crisis, and false solutions are those um, fixes or solutions that are being promoted to address the climate crisis um, in particular, and often includes environmental and biodiversity crisis, um, using this crisis as the justification to advance um, solutions and fixes that only scratch the surface or even address the symptoms, but not the root cause. And in many cases, um, these solutions are technological in nature, um, making us believe that um, technological fixes 
are going to solve a problem that is way beyond um, technological in nature. In the case of climate, biodiversity, environmental crisis, these are actually structural um, in nature, as we as we know, and even more so in the discussion of climate, where there's a lot of justice issues, injustice issues, both um, historical, generational, and also when it comes to relationship between North and South, and of course, um, the fundamental issue of reliance and dependence on fossil fuels. None of these technological issues address that. I will let me cite um, examples of all solutions. Um, in the current um, um, crisis, no, over the the climate crisis, the urgency to address the climate crisis, um, solutions like geoengineering, um, hiding behind the name of carbon dioxide removal, net emissions technologies are being promoted as the solution to the climate crisis, to global warming um, in particular. And among this, um, like in the case of carbon dioxide removal, cases like uh, CCS or bioenergy, um, carbon capture and storage or BECS are being promoted even at high level as the solution um, to, uh, to take us out of this um, crisis that we are we are stuck in. If you will look deeply into the solutions, including, um, for example, CCS, they, are, they do not at all address dependence on uh, fossil fuel. So not at all touching the root. They're just saying, okay, uh, because there, we have been burning and we'll probably continue to burn uh, for generations to come, we'll give you a solution that will suck um, carbon out of the atmosphere or will capture carbon before it escapes into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, we'll give you net emissions um, technology. And lo and behold, um, not surprising that in many cases, the primary pushers behind the large-scale adoption of these technologies, including BEX, for example, are actually actors in the fossil fuel um, industry. The biggest investors on CCS technologies or BEX or, or DAX, no? direct actor, uh, um, direct um capture air capture are actually fossil fuel players um, big uh, big oil including um, shell for example or even the most um, desperate solutions like solar radiation management actually have the big oil um, behind them the link between big oil um, who have brought us into this problem and also countries that have um, so that they continue to support this despite all the rhetoric are behind this um, false solution so it's easy to be deluded. It's easy to to get trapped because um, they will they continue to use the climate crisis as the justification and make us believe that well, even if we stop breathing, we will not be able to address um, greenhouse gas emissions. So might as well um, adapt these technologies, um, bringing us into that that trap um, of slippery slope, and also uh, making us believe that technological uh, fixes can save us. From this crisis, so these are um, examples of false solutions, um, concretely in the climate um, climate sphere. I hope I've answered your question. Oh, one more, one more. Um, interesting. I'd like to link it to my story um, earlier. That in many of these discussions, um, I always get struck, no, by the by the prominence and dominance of men whenever technological fixes are on the table. It's always, almost always men. Like, I cannot even find examples or incidents where you have women pushing for geoengineering. Like, it's always a clique of men, uh, most of them white um, in the North, who who also boast of, of really sterling um, academic backgrounds as um, claiming that they have the solution that they're going to save the world uh, from this mess that we are in. And yes, um, often voices of women, uh, particularly women who have no background um, as, as Harvard or Oxford, are often left voiceless in these discussions because they would always say it has to be science-based, you know, as if concerns of communities, concerns about children, concerns about the impact of the climate um, on the ground are just secondary um, stories. Um, behind or after, that will come after. Um, 
you know, the high-tech solutions that are brought into the table. So that's my response. Catherine. I hope that I answered the question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. So my question to you is, uh, because I know that you are really involved in dealing all the time with people um, from the government, also from other organizations, and um, also dealing with people in politics on different levels. Uh, what is your um, thought on false solution tackling the climate crisis? And also, if there is a link, do you think, to the topic of gender justice? Uh, well, I, it's true that I deal with people in the government, at, especially the local government and in the council. And yes, there is a, a connection because... Um, First of all, the council is mostly dominated by men. And even uh, the few women, I'm talking about, uh, I'm giving you a case study of Wakiso District Local Government or local council where I work. Uh, our council is dominated by men. And um, the women who are there also don't get the chance of talking or of being heard or of their decisions being respected. Uh, for example, when uh, there is something like um, building a well, a well or a stream where to get water from, when they're making a decision and uh, it is something that will help the community because uh, uh, there is no water, the men will not support it a lot because they don't know which problems the women get. And the women who, are, who would have wanted to support it are a few, and yet the majority takes it all. So when, if it is by count of hand, the men will uh, mostly win the discussion. And then there was also a, a problem of um, men thinking that whatever they say, the women should support them. Uh, for example, I'm sorry, I'm giving this example because I asked permission from that gentleman. There was a man in, in the council who also had a wife who was also in the council. And when there was a subject, and the woman didn't support it and the man supported it, he came out and said, how can the woman, how can the woman not support what he has said and yet he is his, has, her husband? I told Sula, Sula, what you have said is so, so bad and I'm going to use you as an example in one of my feminist discussions. He said, Dorothy, you can go on but you know very well that it's not right for a woman not to support what her husband has said. So in this case, I'm saying that the, there is still male dominance in, in, in the councils, both local and national level. And with the government, for example, when they, because most offices are dominated by men, when they decide to send women, for example, to cops, it is men who decide. That's why you see that most of the people who represent government here are men, because there are many in, in government offices. That is how offices and uh, councils are connected with the, um, climate justice here in Uganda. Thank you so much for your answer. So now I would love to go from Uganda to the situation in Germany. So Helena, uh, how is the situation in Germany uh, in the climate and energy politic and also economy? Who has the power there and is this a problem? Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite obvious. It's mostly older white men. I kind of get them all confused because I feel like a lot of the CEOs and, you know, P 
people who are sitting in the power positions kind of all look the same. <laughs> um, and um, uh, we see that all over the world, that the people who got us into this problem in a lot of places are not women, it was men, you know, who decided to put profits over, you know, my generation's future and over people's lives all over the world. And um, yeah, we see that especially concerning fossil fuel companies and um, the energy sector and um, technology and so on. It's a lot of, you know, the power positions are, are, um, are, are men. Um, and that, that can be a huge problem, obviously. And we see that again and again when we're trying to, you know, in conversations with those people, um, but also in the way that, um, yeah, they react to youth activists and they, but more, most, you know, the worst of all, it, it doesn't really matter as much if they respect us as activists, you know, the worst is obviously what they're doing um, to our resources and to the environment and so on. Thank you. So um, my next question would be again to Dorothy. Um, because, well, we heard just from the situation in Germany and Germany is one of the countries who is, um, well, as an industry nation, um, is one of the reasons the climate crisis does exist. And well, but the, the climate policy um, right now um, doesn't, yeah, uh, is not on the level <laughs> of the Paris Agreement. Um, but, and uh, I would love to ask you if it's okay, um, because uh, in Germany, we don't discuss, um, the, discuss this topic uh, on a daily basis, or we don't discuss it when we talk about climate policy that much. Um, who is most affected by the climate crisis right now? And, um, so and home and also the question is how much power and decision making structures do they have as a, the people who are most affected? Um, if you like to to tell us about that. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's not a rumor that women, especially in the global south, contribute less to the greenhouse gas emissions, but they in fact suffer the most because of the gender inequality and the gender social constructs in Uganda, Africa, and other parts of the world, especially in the global south, uh, that dictate some roles for women. Women are the ones who are responsible for house chores and taking care of the whole family. Because of the prolonged droughts, hunger, set sin, and it is the women to suffer looking for food. They go long distances to look for firewood and water. Uh, uh, where they get a lot of problems like being raped or kidnapped on the way. Besides, in Uganda, women are mostly employed in the agriculture sector, yet this sector has been so affected by climate crisis, making them jobless. And remember the IPC report in 2018, it said the world's poor will suffer most and everyone here knows that the highest percentage of the world's poor are women. So they're already suffering because they cannot even afford adaptation, some of the adaptation measures. And when it comes to decision-making, women are few in the decision-making structures because it is so complicated for them to compete with men since they spend most of the time looking after families, offering labor on farms, they do not get enough time to campaign. So they are few in parliament and in council. And even the few ones who are there, like I already said, the decisions are not respected. They are not given the chance to talk. Uh, like I already said, I, would, I work with local council five, so I already see them in council women are sometimes even reminded of their places. Like a woman, a man is not ashamed to tell you you are a woman. What are you talking about? So their voices regarding climate justice is 
really me think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just have like a little follow up question um, because I also know that you're really involved in the UN climate negotiation. So why is it so important, or especially for women of the Global South to get involved and to make their voices heard there? Thank you very much. One thing I know is you cannot separate women's rights and climate justice. There cannot be realization of climate justice without respect for women's rights. For example, land rights. Most women in Uganda do not have land rights. There is a, uh, there are some trees called eucalyptus, which are known for making the land and its surrounding very dry and infertile. But because it is commercial and because the men are naturally money minded, they prefer planting those types. And since the women do not have land rights, they cannot dictate even if they wanted to plant indigenous trees like mutuba. I don't know how, how what it's called in English. It's, I have a, <laughs> a local name, but these trees are indigenous and good. And also women sometimes want to plant fruit trees. So as they serve environmental protection, they serve as something to eat for, for their children and for their family. But the men end up destroying land fertility because we do not have a say and yet when the land becomes infertile it is women who will suffer the consequences most offices are dominated by men that is why the cop 23 gender action plan is lacking when the minister of environment sends delegates to cops the delegation is full of men because they did state on the list so you find that the decisions are mostly dominated by men, yet women are not only the ones who suffer most with climate crisis, but they're the ones who have the power to change the situation. So it is really hard for us. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to stay on like the international level of the UN climate conference and negotiations. And well, today it's the day of the Paris Agreement. And five years ago, it was the first time that also the 1.5 degree target um, was written down in the Paris Agreement at the, UN, at the UN climate conference. And it was also an effort, especially from countries from the global south and the International Civil Society um, for Climate Justice. And Ned, I would love to, to ask you about the Paris Agreement. Um, so after five years, what is your conclusion of it, um, especially in terms of gender justice combined with climate justice? And how should we go forward? In terms of gender justice, um interfacing with climate justice, definitely we're very far off from even the the gender-related goals of the, the Paris Agreement. Like, of course, uh, women and the uh, women's movement were very hopeful. Uh, women's movement working on climate justice were very hopeful that um, gender um, justice um, would be integrated in the whole implementation and, and also the deliberations around the Paris Agreement, but it's been a struggle. Um, it's been a really, really um, tough struggle you know, in the last five years. There are some um, accomplishments in terms of having a gender work plan, also having some um, discussions on gender and adaptation, gender and loss and damage, but it's the same pattern that you have gender discussions on one, one small, small, um, portion, small, small, tiny um, section, and everybody else discusses um, climate issues without even a gender lens. And that's, that's not ideal, because as mentioned by, by Dorothy, unless there is gender justice, you can never achieve um, climate justice. 
And because the role of women, the recognition, not just the recognition, but really um, um, the institutionalization of the key role played by women um, in addressing, um, in, in um, delivering climate justice, also um, the need to address the fundamental structural um, problems, you no, know, like um, land rights and the gender issues around land rights, you no know, access to resources. Unless you address those, we are really very far off from even even addressing the Paris goals and much more so in enriching or achieving um, climate climate justice. We cannot um, go on um, deliberations um, about conceptual um, um, gender gender issues in climate issues and have that in a tiny corner while the rest just go on, no, without even lens um, consciousness or even um, uh, a recognition of the fundamental need to address clim- uh, gender 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 justice when you talk about um, the climate crisis. So you can never have it separate. It has to be um, integrated. It has to be institutionalized. And we're very, very far off from that. But of course, um, hats off to the women's movement who have been really, um, really asserting and also using optimally um, the, the spaces, available spaces that are offered um, in the Paris Agreement, largely because it recognizes um, the role of women, um, human rights on paper, but putting that um, in action um, is a long way to go. And concretely, I also I was actually also struck you know, that despite the Paris Agreement, despite all the work on having a gender um, action plan, work plans um, in the UNFCCC and and in the, in the Paris um, Agreement, like it was I was struck that um, the technology discussions, the technology deliberation um, within the Paris Agreement continue to be male dominated and male oriented. And I would say male orientation, the hard technology orientation that um, in order to be effectively, in order to effectively address um, concerns on adaptation and mitigation, technology, I think the hard technology has to be there. Like there has to be um, like technological, hard technology um, um, solutions um, that are factored in, even um, gaining pro- prominent, um, prominent attention over the soft ones. And it's really um, striking how women then enters when they start discussing soft um, technologies. The soft technologies involve innovation, um, community actions, you know, um, those things. And that are always associated with communities, always associated with women. And this is very, very typical um, um, conceptual um, framing in, in a patriarchy. We haven't really gone away from that. Unless we go away from that, no, as addressed, as mentioned by, by Dorothy, unless we address, um, the gender injustice, um, that has, that has brought us into the situation, aggravating the climate crisis, we will never get out of this frame. Sorry for being pessimistic about it, but it's also a challenge, no, uh, for us to start addressing this. Like there, there's, um, increasingly attention and time or even media attention being given to generational issues and Helena and the Pride Day for the Future um has been also um has to be given recognition for their role in that. Uh I wish we could also have that <laughs> in the case of women, like really integrating um um gender um gender justice into this whole discussion on how to address the climate um the climate crisis and really um uh, bringing um, the solutions that are brought by women at the community level, at the national level, at the global le- level, um, on par, you no, know, with the attention, investment, and money that is be- being put on the macho uh, solutions, um, largely hard, hard technology. So yeah, so I, I hope that would actually be taken as a challenge rather than. Um, being looked at as a very uh, pessimistic view on the situation. Thank you. Um, I have a little follow-up question. So very concrete. Um, can you tell us also more about the topic? Why do we need a gender-based strategies to deal with the cruel reality of the climate crisis we already have? 
um, like when a cyclone is hitting uh, countries and islands, um, why is it also too, so important to have gender-based strategies? Well, yes, of course. As I was mentioning earlier, um, gender-based strategies or even the whole discussion of gender justice cannot be just an adjunct or an afterthought or a small discussion in the overall um, climate justice um, discussion. It has to be integrated, incorporated in all that. And as, I, as you mentioned, gender-based um, strategies, um, largely because women... Um, it's not just traditional, but it also comes um, in our nature of caring, not just caring for the family, but caring for the community and caring for nature. Um, the working with nature um, 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 strategies um, are, are often associated with women, um, largely because of a patriarchal view that women should take care of caring. <laughs> and I think we should bust that, that caring comes with us as nature that um, the solutions lie in caring for nature and caring for each other, not not in, um, how do you call it, um, this, this, this term about um, subduing, not about subduing nature. I think the, the subduing nature framework that is associated with patriarchy is also responsible for the problems that we have. Like, why don't we flip it around and, and start um, framing our strategies about um, caring for nature, working with nature, and yes, um, gender, and that's really at the heart of gender-based um, strategies, um, really addressing the problems um, right from the community, right from the family. Like, for example, uh, concretely, you know, in the case of cyclones, um, last month, like, we had a series of three strong typhoons um, in the north that have really brought brought so much devastation to our compatriots living in 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 the north so much flooding like in fact there are still communities that are flooded at this very time that i'm speaking um because this is um type typhoon um season and you have this um super super typhoons um that many scientists have actually associated with global warming because of the the um historical warming of the of the pacific that have really brought so much force to this typhoon um devastating um, communities um, in that eastern seaboard of the Philippines um, and all that. And it's really striking that um, that many of the prominent solutions, quote-unquote, that are being promoted and largely by men who are, uh, who are there at the top of the bureaucratic ladder, um, who are heading the government and local government and also acting as spokesperson. Um, um, around um, the, the crisis um, brought by this um, typhoon, that the solutions that are being prominently promoted are actually about infrastructures, technology, like building more uh, flood gates or building more um, dredging. No, and then like if you hear about the, the stories that barely get the headline but really are being told in the media no? as part of the sub stories in media stories, like women talking about um, planting trees, also taking care of mangroves, and um, addressing the issue of, of deforestation and illegal logging. So these are two parallels. You have prominent government officials who are mainly men, I'd say almost 100% men, talking about infrastructure, building more infrastructure, floodgates, dredging rivers, and and building um, communities in, in higher grounds. But here you have secondary stories of women who are really pushing for um, solutions that are closer to home, that can actually bring us back closer to nature, that are manageable by communities, that also address the fundamentals, which is, which is um, inequality in terms of access to resources and also um, disempowerment caused by usurping and um, abuse of power um, that are really bringing about massive um, deforestation, illegal logging, and, and mining. So these are parallel realities that we need to put together um, towards a gender-based strategies that incorporate, um, incorporate um, gender-sensitive um, um, strategies and bringing together the soft, so-called soft and hard technologies and and putting that into practice by uh, putting political will into it, 
putting financial investment and also um, a lot of 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 um, energy um, into it, collective energy into it, not just as an aside, not just a small as a small discussion in a corner. So I think um, unless we incorporate all that um, towards a meaningful gender strategy, um, it will be a far off dream, no? Um, for us to address the climate crisis, it's really time, over time, um, long time, no, for us to be um, hearing about uh, women, women um, solutions that are pushed by women that are actually gender um, sensitive. So that's my uh, long answer to the question, Catherine. It really fires me off <laughs> the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the information. It was amazing. Um, and so. My next question um, would go also to Helena, again, uh, to the international level. Um, so, because Fridays for Future five years ago didn't exist, but now you are there, like the next generation of uh, climate activists, climate justice activists. And what does the Paris, Paris Agreement um, means to you and to Fridays for Future? And how do you want to go forward? What are your demands? Yeah, so I think from in 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 opposite to a lot of other people in the climate justice movement, the Paris Future has from the very beginning had the the Paris Agreement kind of as a basis. So from the very beginning, it's been like a very clear message that this you know it's already been signed. You know, governments have already actually agreed to do all this stuff, and now they just have to keep what they've what they signed, and they have to keep what they promised. And I think that that puts us in a very different position in where we start with you know our argumentation so um the Paris agreement builds like a basis for a lot of what you know we as far as the future do and you know I what I as an activist do because it's reminding people again and again that we this like there was already a compromise there was already agreement between you know global states but already 1.5 degrees is going to be really bad for a lot of people who are already suffering under the climate crisis so that was already like an international compromise that was made and that builds a lot of what you know that's kind of the basis for a lot of the work we do and um that's why we actually had a huge day of international action yesterday um basically to this for this anniversary um uh, reminding everyone that we need to fight for 1.5 um, where we had actions all over the world, um, kind of commemorating this this day, and um, so I guess it, it, in that sense we haven't really like we're not that's, that's not going to change how we move forward from this point. But I feel, but at the same time, we obviously see that this agreement is not is not really working because now all these governments are putting in their new reduction goals for 2030 and 2050 and so on. And we see that in the end, it doesn't add up. So we don't, you know, we don't arrive at 1.5 degrees. Um, and we don't, we see that the UCO, the, the UCO which decided its CO2 reduction goals um, on Thursday, that's also nowhere near, you know, Paris conform. And that is obviously going to, that going, means that we can't stop fighting. So we need to just um, fight harder and we need to, um, take to you know continue actually the work that we've done over the last two years and it's not going to be easy and um i feel like what we have what we've seen though in in this past time is how how conversations and discourse with people over the world and with people on the front lines of the climate crisis can really bring that conversation along kind of so um hearing from people who are you know feeling the effects of the climate crisis quite directly um, right now and are still protesting and are still um, lobbying for change has you know been quite impactful to myself um, in the last few weeks and um, I feel like that can that's really something that we're hopefully going to be doing more moving along kind of highlighting voices and showing what 1.5 means basically not as a not as an agreement and not as a um, a list of you know degrees and reductions and so on because all these things can kind of seem very very far from reality and kind of talking a lot more about what what that means personally and you know 
kind of bringing that emotion to the table because in the end we're not going to build connection we're not going to build um, a societal majority by talking about facts we're going to talk, we're going to you know reach those by talking about telling stories and talking about each other and how the climate crisis affects us and other people and um yeah i hope to be doing that a lot more moving forward thank you i would love to stay with you for the next question and go uh, because you built the bridge also to us as a movement how we uh, start to create like this other world which could be possible um, as a movement and also tackle the issues of gender justice, social justice. And I know that one of your topics is the importance of um, intersectionality. And I also know that this word, some, maybe some of the audio men members doesn't know the word yet. Um, and so I would love like just to ask you to explain the reason, yeah. uh, so the meaning, and also the reason why it's important to you. Yeah. So I think the 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 basic belief behind the term intersectionality is that we cannot look at societal crises and societal problems as isolated from one another. So I feel like we've talked a lot about that without naming, you know, this word. We've talked a lot about that this evening already. How we cannot look at feminism as a separate issue from the climate crisis, and we cannot look at it as a separate issue from our social problems and so on. And you know, because we already see that the climate crisis is not affecting everyone equally, so we cannot, you know, aim to to solve it with blanket technology solutions or blanket solutions. We need to solve it with the people who are most affected. We need to solve it, you know, seeking to get rid of these huge inequalities. And that is also what the what the word, you know, what climate justice is all about. You know, creating a more just world and not just creating a world in which we have less emissions because you know we're not doing i feel like a lot of the time we we use words like saving the planet or saving the world like that's it's not about that it's about saving the future of humanity and you know making a world that's livable for us so this is all about making a world that's better for people to live in and we cannot make a better world for people if we don't look at what what the different crises are that are affecting us right now and that are affecting different people in different ways and so that's why it's so so important that we that we that we think of this as a societal problem as a whole and that we think of the climate crisis as not an isolated issue from all these other crises and um we can do that on like an international level all the time but we can also do that on like a small level so um we actually did some different campaigns together with different um uh um Uh, groups um, concerning like labor reform and um, better pay and so on because um, in the in the public transportation sector uh, most recently um, because that is an issue where we see again that we cannot think of you know um, of reform of job markets and reform of working conditions separately from the issues that are facing us as a society and it's the same thing with feminism if we if we if we want if we if we're seeing that obviously women worldwide are affected more harshly from the climate crisis then we need to take that in account when we think of solutions um, and I think that's that's kind of most important because otherwise we're not we're not being honest to ourselves about what this means and we're not you know looking looking further than maybe our own feet because if, you know I personally might not be affected as much by the different inequalities in our society because, you know, I'm a white privileged young person living in Europe. Um, but that's, you know, it would be unfair if, if I then seek to only find a solution or if I only seek to lobby for solutions that are, you know, maybe most profitable to, to, to a certain group of people. Thank you so much. So um, I would love to, to stay on the topic um, about our climate justice movement. And my next question would go to, again, to Dorothy. And also it's a little bit like a follow-up question. Um, so as, um, well, the question is like, really, are we as a climate justice movement, are we already a feminist movement? What do you think about that? And do we think enough as a movement about a topic of, intersectionality and if not what has to change i think i cannot say that we are not yet there 
that we are not uh, acting like a feminist group. We are really trying. We are acting like a feminist group. It's just that don't people don't want to listen and people don't want to know the truth, but we are really acting it. Uh, about what we are doing, uh, this, what we are talking about now, uh, these topics we have. And we don't only stop there, we go on our social media and always remind people. So I really think, I cannot say we are there, but again, I cannot say that we are not doing much because I always follow you on Twitter and I see what is going on. I follow Hilda. I follow other people from other parts of the country. And I think we are really there. And uh, we, we just need to be encouraged by what we are doing. For example, um, I know we haven't realized the goals of the Gender Action Plan, which was uh, achieved in, in 2017 at, at COP23 in Bonn. But at least there is a change in numbers. But what brought about the change in numbers? It's because of the noise we make, us as the uh, people in the movement. At first, we, uh, people didn't care about that. But when we start making noise, when start, we start talking about it, it really happens slowly by slowly. The gender action plan is not fully achieving, has not fully achieved its goals, but for the numbers, there is an increment. So it's one of the examples to show that we are acting like a feminist group and that we should be encouraged but by the small things we have achieved to go on, I know that in the end, we are going to achieve more than that if we fight more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ned, I also would love to ask you because, well, you're very experienced in working for like huge uh, NGOs and groups are working together with them. Um, and they are also like part of the climate justice movement. Um, so how is there also like, should we also like change cultures there in parts uh, in terms of that women should be more like uh, not only the heads of the NGOs or groups, but also like um, be included in the important decision-making structures inside environmental NGOs. Sometimes, <laughs> even in, within the movements, imagine the movement is fighting for feminine, uh, like uh, women rights or gender rights, but they're not even acting as one. They think they still come in and dominate. So it should start with uh, from home. Like it should start, like they say, uh, charity begins at home. If you're really fighting for gender justice, why don't you show it by leaving it? The feminist groups should walk that talk. It should begin with them. They should let the women also be heard in their own homes before they go out to tell others to, to respect women's voices. That needs to change because it is there, even in uh, in in gender groups and feminist groups. Thank you. So um, I would love to ask Ned one question and then go yeah. around uh, because I in in Germany the huge environmental NGOs, so all of them, um, also, or most of them, they have all males as uh, like the chef the chief person and uh, so so for me it's also like a question how can we inside our climate justice movement uh, when we look to the NGOs or to to uh, big groups um, how can can we also there fight for more uh, gender equality yeah that is a that's a very interesting question Katrin and very um, touchy <laughs> question um, as well 
like as I like while you are asking the question, like my mind is hearing like um um thinking about the environmental um justice movement in the south and also the role of women. Like in the past ten years, I've actually or even more or even earlier, I've actually seen um this this big wave of of women, um young women um in particular, um really playing lead role um in environmental movements in the south um in particular like i cannot think of an envir- of a big environmental um group now that has not put um a woman in a lead role not necessarily the executive director but really um lead role but there's more and more um directorship coordinator um among environmental justice um organizations in the south that are being taken on by women and i hope to see that um in the north as well like as i look i review in my mind um the north americans uh, there's much more um to be done but of course uh, we're talking here like when we talk of feminism and gender justice it's actually beyond numbers so we're not just counting the number of women um taking lead roles or being directors of environmental justice movement in the same way like we'll probably see in the next 10 20 years more and more women taking in uh prominent roles um in corporate uh world um maybe even in the fossil fuel industry maybe longer but we've seen that um wave um in the environmental justice movement especially um in the south in terms of number we have come a long way but definitely gender justice goes beyond number it's actually the framing as well, as well and there's much more orientation um really um expression of that um in the environmental justice movement like um in in the place where i am no in in southeast asia and asia pacific um in general there's much more strong um assertion um of that um the gender lens no the gender justice to be incorporated in the whole discussion of environmental and climate justice i think that that's a good um direction but we it's not that we can do it in one part of the world and then the rest of the world goes business as usual we would really want to see that um happening um in in the rest of of the world because not just because again it's not just about counting numbers but really incorporating um gender lens the gender justice within the environmental justice movement and also in the climate justice movement as you as you mentioned and as we started the discussions our stories earlier we're still fighting even within the movement no like really calling out like i even um i even have friends who really not just call out but really assert physically you know like to the to the border in the border of of, of violence really asserting um that gender justice um practice not just orientation among us so it's really a continuing education for all of us even among us as uh as feminists as um advocates of just gender justice even the use of language for example like i myself have been um not a victim even a culprit no i've been called out many times by colleague in the past like oh stop using that language because that's really um uh, that's really antithetical you know, to gender justice. So I really keep on 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 checking ourselves. And to me, that's a good process, like um, criticizing and reflecting on ourselves, on each other, because um, you know we are products of patriarchy, long generations, generations of patriarchy, and it's really a process, continuing process to shed that. Like um, I am sure it's really um doubly hard for our friends um in the north no really encountering whiteness all over and maleness um and not to mention the age age side and even among us no um in in the south um especially um in cultures that really promote uh, uh patriarchy that really is based on patriarchy so it's really a continuing struggle continuing education and there's also another incorporation integration that we all need to be very conscious about like the integration among movements you know the environmental and climate justice movement and gender and gender justice and women's movement there's a lot of effort towards that like um in the region where i am in asia pacific like we have this umbrella 
called Asia Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism that continuously pushes for integration of those concerns, um, including LGBT concerns, the concerns of persons with disabilities, incorporating those in one comprehensive, holistic view of engagement that incorporates um, the different lenses, the different um, histories and experiences that we're bringing and different struggles that we're bringing into this, the movement that we are in. You know, like, um, I think uh, while we are um, critical of the, the maleness, the whiteness, the ageism, um, on the other side that breeds the kind of inequality and uh, based on patriarchy that we are facing, that we are um, struggling struggling with. Um, we are also in that uh, part, juncture of history where we're trying to incorporate all the, the movements that are we have now at the present that are products of decades of struggles at the local, national, and global level into one comprehensive, holistic, also um, strategic, and um, conscious about inter intergenerational responsibilities and justice into one movement that could not just critique, critique but offer uh, very um, sound and practical solutions that are relevant on the ground, at the same time doable at the national and global level. So I'm hopeful, very hopeful, like I've spent more than half of my life um, into this movement, and I've seen, I've seen um, advances that I did not imagine. Like I also see that there's a lot still that we need to change, um, especially on the political, um, political side. But I am very, very hopeful. Also, very glad about um, new movements that have been brought about by the crisis, multiple crises that we're facing, such as um, the Friday, Friday for the Future. There's also a lot left political movements that are also as conscious, also as, um, as um, concerned, but needs to be incorporated in the fold uh, for us to be much more strategic in addressing all this crisis and pre presenting a doable solution. Thank you. Um, my next round would be um, a question. Um, about how could men improve their behavior? So this is a question sometimes um, men are asking me, okay, oh, how can I be now a feminist? How can I change? Uh, how can I um, step out of the system of patriarchal behavior? And um, I think it's, it's really important. Um, it's important uh, also to talk how, talk about what can men do? And I think that also some are listening and maybe some have especially this question about, okay, where, where should I start? Where should I start to change? Because, well, um, we want to create a feminist world, an equal world, and also without um, toxic behavior of the patriarchal system, which is also hurting men. And so um, I would love to make a round. And if you like, that you can tell um, the first things that maybe a man can do or change um, to be part of our like feminist climate justice movement uh, or to improve or to just to think about. So, um, yeah, this is a, not a normal round of question, but I think it's, it's very important. Um, so where, where would you start or what would you ask if a man would tell you um, where to, to change or what is important, which could be the first step. Um, so does someone wants to, to start? I can start. I'm so happy <laughs> that men ask you what they can do to change and where they can start to improve. Uh, in my opinion, it should start by being interested in hearing about our stories. Uh, like if we can involve them, if, if they can come to our meetings like this one and listen to us and listen to what, uh, that we don't mean any harm when we fight for, for, for the rights, 
when we fight for our rights to be for our voices to be heard i think it's very important and that is the first first step because they cannot um changing their behavior without hearing why uh, well, that's why um when they come they they can hear how we suffer we think they know but sometimes they don't for example some men think that women's rights activists like me are there to spell their women they think that women's rights mean the women are going to be big-headed and stop being submissive to their husbands but when they sit down with us during our work uh, our talks and our workshops to and listen they'll go out with that urge to change and they will even start fighting for women's rights themselves so i think they should be sensitized to come and join us and listen to us that's the very starting point from me thank you thank you that's a cool cool first step so annette or helena do you want to add something shall i go next <laughs> and this is an example of a very basic question that is um hard no to to answer you know like um to me my my, my instant reaction is to start at home you know like um in order for you to see for men to see the problem in society um the gender um issues that confront uh, women um in society you have to start from home like patriarchy starts at home and it's it's also the place where it has to be addressed um at its roots like i remember um recently last year there was actually a korean film that actually tackled this the the um story of a woman going through um the problems um confronting confronting problems that are um stemming from patriarchy and there was really violent reaction <laughs> among men not just in korea but also in other parts of asia because they think it's too harsh they think it's not true they think it's too dramatized but to me when i watch it like i said gosh this is so true and what dorothy was saying like confronting the fact you know, confronting the reality hard in a hard way that you have to be um hard on yourself on men um for men to be hard on themselves to accept that this is the truth um rather than being close to um to being told that this is the problem um that um closing your mind is uh, is actually not going to bring us anywhere in addressing the problem it's just it, it won't go beyond words um if we don't um harshly accept the ugly reality that faces us in terms of gender inequality that exists at home in the community in society and and globally like it's hard to say uh for men to put um, themselves in women's shoes that's not easy if you are going to if you are trapped in a patriarchal mind the first thing is really to shed that and shedding that does not happen overnight um as um the dorothy said like for men to be exposed um on um discussions like sharing of experiences um also uh processes led by women is a step but to me uh, what lies at the heart is also addressing this at the community um level like in my past um experiences in work when i was a lot um younger i was often confronted by um ex ex incidents where women would arrange a meeting like in the evening and half of the women will not show up because they're told by husband not to go because they're not yet finished about uh, washing the dishes putting the kids to sleep cleaning the house before they even could attend to community issues and the men um in in many cases would just be chatting away or even watching the tv listening through the radio and all that that prevents even women not to go into processes that would help them reflect and overcome the the obstacles within the home and in the community um that actually breeds patriarchy so like we have to really bust this at the root and it's actually at the home where it starts like um all these um ceos in suits the white aging ceos um 
um, it's not it's hard to judge them for what they are at home, but it would be good um, to reflect on what they are, on what we are, what we do at home, um, to be able to address problems in the community and also um, in society. So thanks for asking that very um, interesting question at at 4 a.m. at my 4 a.m. Catherine. Thank you so much. So Helena, do you also want to add something or should we go to the next round? Yeah, I feel like what's really important is to recognize that there's like, you will, we cannot, like we can't get rid of, you know, the patriarchy from one day to the next as much as I would love that. And I feel like a lot of time, especially in the climate justice movement, um, you know, men tend to think, okay, they're feminists now, then it's done, you know, they've done everything they need to do, and they can move on with their lives. And I feel like, you know, we can't do that as women, because we continue to be affected, you know, by inequality and so on. And I think what's so important is that we recognize that it's a process. And, you know, as people raised in the society, we can't get rid of our biases and, and the way we are brought up from one second to the next. And much more it is a practice of working against that and working to listen to women, working to, um, you know, educate yourself, to read, to um, listen constantly. And I feel like um, to know, you know, without having the goal of being perfect but much more having the goal to be better and I think that is you know something that if we take that to heart and if men you know um, really instead of wanting to reach a status where they can say oh I'm I'm not sexist um, but much more to reach a status where they're working against being sexist so they want to be less sexist I think we could um, already make a lot of progress. Thank you. Thank you for this round. And um, because we didn't get any question from the audience yet, um, I think I would love to go to our like final round. Um, so we have like 10 minutes um, less, uh, more time than I thought. <laughs> and so, and because my last question or my last round um, would be that I would love to ask you about your own projects because I know that you are, every one of you is pretty busy and having a lot of different projects around the topic of climate, climate justice. And uh, so I would love like to just to ask you if could you present your projects and also maybe tell us a little bit about um, how you are, well, how you, um, how you tackle the, the, the question of uh, gender justice inside your projects. Um, so how you are dealing with, with this struggle daily in your projects, that would be like maybe a really practical thing to know about. And also, um, if you like, you can also tell us uh, because the, most of the audience we have today, it's like from Germany. Uh, and if you like, you can also uh, tell us how we can maybe support from Germany, uh, the projects, um, if there is any chance. Dorothy, would you love to start? Because I know a project uh, from Uganda, which is pretty cool and which people need to know about. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, uh, like I introduced myself in the beginning, I am the founding chairperson of Kona Women Sustainable Agriculturalists and environmental group. Uh, and this is a registered organization. It is uh, what we call community-based organization. And it's not like a big one, but it's for indeed, uh, uh, for grassroots women. And uh, when we realized that um, there is a lot of cutting of trees and our forests are disappearing, we said we should do something about it. But also we said that by doing so, by protecting the environment, we should also think about uh, the livelihoods of women. So besides planting vegetables that um, we sell off, we decided to put up a project. It's called Briquettes Project. 
briquettes are an alternative energy used for cooking or heating. In Uganda, we don't do heating that much. Uh, it's almost summer <laughs> every time. So we use it for cooking. So in Uganda, the commonly used uh, type of energy for cooking is firewood and charcoal. That firewood and charcoal is got by cutting trees. And the more we use charcoal and, uh, and firewood, the more we lose our forests and trees. So we found out about the, that project of briquettes, which are made using the locally available materials. These materials include wastes, uh, like banana peels, it can be potato peels, and then you can add in um, anthill soil, which is also good, uh, which is available locally. And then there is a very cheap paste, which is called cassava, cassava flour. It is, it is also mixed in there to act as starch, like to make the, the briquettes hard. So instead of using charcoal or firewood, we use those briquettes for cooking. And in doing so, we are saving the environment. We are saving money because charcoal has become so, so, so expensive in Uganda. So we save money, which we would have spent on, on buying charcoal and we save our trees. Also, when we do extra than what we are using at home, we sell it to other people. Uh, but right now the project is not so big uh, because we use our hands. There are some groups which use machines that we haven't yet bought. And also we'd like to take that uh, project to other villages and to other women, but we cannot do so because we need support in terms of mobilization, in terms of facilitating the trainers, in terms of like hiring a place where to train other women and other men. By the way, it's not only women who, it's a women's movement, it's a women's group, but also men come and join us when we are learning how to make briquettes. So that's one project that we have so far. And uh, it is uh, connected to gender, to, to, uh, to, to, to gender and climate justice, because when women are empowered, they still, when they are empowered economically, they are empowered socially. A poor woman do, doesn't have the courage to speak in public, but when you get some money from maybe selling those briquettes and um, from your products from agriculture, you can be encouraged to speak in public you will not be minimized. And when you're encouraged to speak in public, your voice will be heard. You can even go to decision-making structures and defend climate justice there. So that's how important our project is. We have many projects, but that's what I can talk about now, the Briquettes Project, which is running as per now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if it's okay, I would love to uh, ask Helena and just round around like um, a special question because right now we heard about the empowerment of women and how important it is. And I know well in Fridays for Future, uh, most people who are speaking to the press are women. And so maybe there are some in the audience, some people are thinking about creating another action group for climate justice. So can you share us a little bit of your experience, uh, how, to, uh, how to create uh, an environment in your group to empower women? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure, I kind of never, I don't really like the discussion about empowering people because I feel like a lot of, like women have power, like we don't need to be giving it, given it and we don't really need to be handed it in that way. So I'm not, I kind of don't like that word to be honest. And I feel like in a lot of places, it's not just giving women power, it's making room for them. Because, you know, we 
the only reason why there's more more you know w- women talking in the press is because there's not men talking in the press so we can't like that's i think that's a huge misconception in a lot of places that um if we only need to you know empower women and we know only need to give them tools and then you know we can reach equality but we can own like there will only be more women in certain positions if there's less men there and i feel like recognizing that and knowing that um, is really important step and we've done that with Fridays for Future in some places and it's you know quite visible in who's talking to the press but I feel like it would be a dishonest if I didn't recognize that that doesn't mean that you know we as a movement have gotten rid of um, inequality and in a lot of places if you take a look behind you know who's in the front rows and if you take a look behind who's talking in the press to you know who's who's talking most of the time in meetings and you know who's deciding what we do then that's not doesn't look quite as rosy to me anymore to be honest um but i feel like we learned from the climate justice movement in a lot of places there so looking at endergelende for instance in germany who i mean you know all about that katrin um who um at because you know they they, they saw that even with with you know um men and women in the press um, in, in comparison, men would be quoted um, um, a hugely more who then decided to only have women um, press speakers. And, you know, that was a huge lesson, I think, that we learned as a climate movement. And that that definitely also um, shaped a lot of what we do with Thrive's Future and in, in the press and in our, um, in our yeah, work on the outside. So I'm not sure if that was a satisfying answer because it's not like it's not an easy one, two, three, this is what you need to do. Um, but um, creating room, making space is, I think, what was really important and what makes it possible for um, yeah, women to feel to live their power and to be in the press and so on. Thank you. So, Ned. Um... Do you also want to to share, uh, like like a story or advice? Um, yes, definitely. Yeah, I, I fully agree with what Helena said. That making space, you no, know, for um, to make space for women and also um, allowing them, enabling them to take that space um, is key and. The two um, initiatives that I will talk about is actually about about that. One is an initiative of um, EPC Group, um, which is re- recently um, launched. We call it the Which Way Forward. Which Way Forward is actually a dialogue um, among um, civil society and social movement actors um, across regions: Africa, Asia, Latin America, and North um, North America and in Europe, um, this is online, um, of course, to this, to reflect, not to allow, uh, provide a space for civil society actors, um, taking, um, very, very conscious, um, effort to, to allow women, to bring in women into the discussion, um, uh, for, 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 um, actors to, and actresses to reflect together on, the role of technology um, in their current lives um, in under the shadow of the, the pandemic. You know? um, also discussing the role of technology and technological solutions that are being peddled to address the climate, biodiversity, and environmental crisis that we are facing. Because it's also not a coincidence that all these um, discussions on the gravity and seriousness of the problems, the crisis in biodiversity, climate, and environment are actually, um, have actually been a lot stronger during the months of the pandemic. And when people felt that we are helpless because we're at home, um, that we are kept um, in, our, in our rooms and in our homes because of fear of being contaminated by, by COVID and all this crisis ringing in your head um, in the media, which um, does not only um, um, aggravate the fear, but also uh, promotes um, helplessness and powerlessness. So the Which Way Forward discussion is for us to reflect on that, to, to uh, bring out the power within, uh, for us to do, together, to, to do things together 
um, in in our homes from our homes um, in in a collective um, collective way and bringing the views of women into this. And as I've noted uh, from the beginning of this discussion, we we would also like to provide um, with the aim is to provide space you know, for women to um, voice out and express their views on technology um, coming from their experiences at home, in the community, in society, and also um, in global engagement. And we'd like to bring the discussions uh, forward uh, from this, um, this, this series of which we forward uh, dialogues um, in reflecting on the, the views of civil society and social movement on the technologies that are being put forth as solutions and pre uh, present this as well to um, um, discussions among civil society and also in governments and also at an intergovernmental um, level. The next um, initiative that I'd like to mention is actually um, on um, promoting community resilience um, through field schools. I am in the board of a national NGO um, called Rice Watch Action Network uh, that we have actually started some 20 years ago. And they have actually pioneered um, the whole practice of community resilience uh, field schools. And have um, they have been implementing it um, in many parts of the Philippines and the model has actually also been adopted in other parts of, of Asia and they've got some citations and awards at the global level for doing this. They work with government, with local government and with um, movements um, at the local level. And Climate Resilience a Field School actually builds on the experiences and reflections of local people, um, in particular women, on on ways no um and means including technological and also social innovation um to address challenges in agriculture uh, posed by the multiple crises that we're facing so concretely in adaptation for example um making use and optimizing indigenous and local local technologies um in particular, um, those that are practiced by women at the local level um, to adapt to uh, and also mitigate um, the climate, the, the um, consequences of the climate crisis, uh, which actually uh, brings um, um, projects like um, women-led um, selection and breeding of adopted um, seeds, um, in particular rice, uh, because um, the Philippines is um, is a, a rice growing um, um, country. We do import because there's so much demand and there's um, also a big pressure on the rice um, growing communities with regards to uh, problems on the environment and also much more because of trade and also um, policies, agricultural policies. So there's a lot of experiences that are actually um, being promoted um, in the climate resiliency uh, field schools about the lessons and also um, the practices and knowledge of women um, in breeding and selecting adaptable um, rice varieties um, depending on the ecosystem and also depending on the um, ecological stresses that are faced um, at the local level such as flooding, salinity, and even drought because you are in, in a country like the Philippines, it's actually the extremes. no. Uh, um, that are being felt uh, with regards to the consequences of global warming. Also, um, the practices of women um, in water management, um, in agriculture, and also uh, promoting um, women-led um, livelihood that are um, centered around um, agricultural production and also um, um, processing you know, of agricultural products. So there's a lot there um, in terms of promoting, and as I mentioned, this has been this initiatives on TRFS, the community resilience field schools have been cited um, in the Philippines and also um, globally. Um, in particular, the role, key role, the primary role played by women uh, farmers um, in these initiatives and building on and promoting their knowledge systems and integrating gender justice in the whole discussion of of addressing um, the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis as well. So those are two um, initiatives that I'd like to share at this point. 
It's so cool. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for all the information you gave us uh, this evening and for being here. Um, it was an honor to have this panel discussion, this, well, the final panel of our conference with you together. And uh, I loved to bring you together and to hear your different perspective and views about climate justice and feminism. Uh, I love, I hope that I see you again soon. <laughs> Um, maybe on Zoom, maybe at the next UN Climate Conference when we are all together, hopefully again, uh, fighting for the <laughs> uh, for fighting for more well voices of the global south and fighting for more voices of women inside the negotiations. And well, I I love that we are on the same page when it's come in terms of okay, we have to end the patriarchal system to fight. The climate crisis and also we have to um, to build more groups where we support each other and it also the man has to learn how to to break loose from patriarchal structures and behavior and also i love to that i learned again so much from you and heard your stories and um well every time i it gave me so so much more hope and also so much more strength to continue the fight for climate justice, especially here in Germany, uh, our local struggle. And well, so for me, it's really, from my heart, thank you so much for being part of this panel and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Katrin. <laughs>